even do the the regular professorial thing and, and read off of a, of a laptop because that's just how I've been disciplined. Um, and, I, and I'm going to also start by thanking uh, both Antonia and Lee, in fact, uh, from Campus Earth Dubai for inviting uh, me to speak as a part of this series. And I'm also going to include uh, acknowledging the institutions behind this because I think it's important to, uh, especially in this, in this context, Campus Earth Dubai, Dubai Culture and Arts Authority and Support from Design District, right? Dubai Design District, D3. Um, because I think having these kinds of critical venues are, is very important for this space. Okay, so uh, what you see here, the title of my presentation today is Intimate Heritage, Constructing a Memory of Gulf Cities. Uh, just to put out at the forefront, this presentation is actually a work in progress. And one of the reasons why I'm presenting it here is because I want to have um, some feedback. So if, if there are ways in which, if there are certain points at which you feel like you engage more, please do bring them up in the question and answer session. I wanted to present something that was local and that was related to our larger CAD theme this year, which is on being slow, time, attention, and the construction of heritage. I also wanted to address things that make me uncomfortable. I found that when I'm uneasy and uncertain, really interesting things happen, especially in terms of the development of theory. A collection of photographs on the wall conjure up strange emotions for me. As a member of a South Asian diaspora living in the United States, photographs on our walls were markers of our heritage, our family we were not living with. They were forms of introduction to people we may never see for a variety of reasons. They were memories. They produced nostalgia. They provided me with a lens through which to appreciate my parents' affective relationship with small pieces of paper that said, this paper manufactured by Kodak. My father loved taking photographs. He loved developing photographs and instilled in me a love for the materiality of the process of developing. Implicitly, I began to understand an intermingling of intimacy with the materiality of the process and paper that was manufactured by Kodak and the people who were developed as images onto that surface. And so it completely unsettled me when decades later, I would ask friends of mine at Brooklyn house parties about their relatives and black and white images posted in their kitchen and hallways. And they would respond, oh no, that's just Americana. We're not really related to them, but aren't these images just beautiful and make you feel a sense of our history? And so this is precisely where I want to begin, to be able to think through various scales of intimacy of heritage, whether it is about people and images, places you walk through, memories created by viewing those, the idea of feeling Americana. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, Americana generally translates to the material things and ideas related to the history and culture of America, or what we call in heritage speak, the tangible and intangible heritage of America. So in our case, based on where I'm currently speaking from, we might consider this to be Emirathana. And in the case of Captain Salman, who you will soon be introduced to as this paper unfolds, the ways in which we understand living in Sharjah, being of South Asian descent, and being, nostalgic, being a nostalgic Anglophile who did not experience the initial formation of a memory. And that was necessarily complicated because heritage and its link to belonging is precisely that, complicated. But in order to make sense of all of this, we can only start from where we are now, here. Let's see, how am I going to get this here? Dubai. Our quintessential view from the sky of what our city looks like. It is tall. It is hazily crisp. It now exudes a steely, business-savvy gray. And in spite of all of its distancing, the moment I see it from my seat on the flight over, my heart skips a beat, and I feel like I'm coming home. It's only been a decade and some that I've been flying to Dubai regularly, but it's long enough to say that I've seen the city from the sky grow up. Not necessarily around me, but below me as I fly into the airport. My home is not in Dubai. Rather, I consider one of my homes to be in Sharjah. And so I began to think about how transit, how one comes into a city, a space, as defining, constructing, or one of Murtaza's favorite terms that we've borrowed from Miriam Cook, an idea of engineering a certain kind of heritage. This has implications for how we see the city, how we see the history, how we might see ourselves within that framework. What we see easily in images like this one are critiques of rampant neoliberalism, cradling specific forms of nostalgia, and constructing a heritage for a very specific form of belonging. But if we hesitate for a moment in the air and think about what it means to land into a place, and where a history of landing might take us, we might come face to face with many intimate ways of knowing land and air, 
and images we often don't think to be our own. And so that brings me to this young man here. Allow me to introduce you to Flight Lieutenant Owen Watkinson. On August 30th, 1958, Flight Lieutenant Owen Watkinson, a young British fighter pilot in his early 20s, took off from RAF Sharjah at the controls of his Venom fighter bomber. His mission was part of Operation Black Magic, the protracted air blockade of rebel strongholds on top of Jebel Akhtar, or the Green Mountain in Oman. The Venom, fitted with extra fuel tanks, carried a deadly payload, four 20 millimeter cannon and four air to ground rockets packed with high explosive. As the jet engine behind him punched his aircraft into the hazy summer sky over Sharjah, the pilot may have taken comfort in the ejector seat with which this latest version of the Venom had been fitted. It would not, however, save him. His last flight and his life would end on the Green Mountain, where he and his fragments of his aircraft, WR-552, remain to this day. The story of Flight Lieutenant Watkinson's last mission was unearthed by Lawrence Gary, a professor of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the United Arab Emirates University in Al Ain. He was on faculty from 2000 to 2004. He now lives in Switzerland. While in the UAE, however, Professor Gary joined the Emirates Natural History Group, whose Al Ain members spent much time exploring over the border in Oman. A qualified pilot and a former RAF reserve officer, he had heard about the remains of an RAF aircraft high in the mountains and, one weekend in October of 2003, he and some of his other members of his group drove 280 kilometers from Al Ain to Jebel Akhtar to find it. As I trace the story of former RAF Lawrence Gary searching for a crashed RAF plane, I stumbled onto an archive discussion that took place in 2011 by a group of enthusiasts and recreational archaeologists through an online network called Professional, Professional Pilots Rumor Network in the subclassified chat room of aviation history and nostalgia. And so in some sense through rumor, I began to learn about a history that was known, acknowledged, and peer-reviewed by all of those pilots who were engaged in very passionate conversations about Sharjah and its first airport. Sharjah was, as many of you know, the first airport in what is now the UAE. In 1932, it was very important for the British, who were developing an air route via the Gulf, to be able to create a staging post in the region. And Sheikh Sultan bin uh, Sakar al Qasmi offered a, a site southeast of what the city was then. The RAF built a runway, and by October 1932, Imperial Airways had built a rest house for their passengers, um, those, of those, those of the passengers who were flying on their Hanley Page HP42S, which was en route between London and British India, and it stops many places on the way. Appropriately, that rest house is now the structure that houses the Al Mahatta Museum. In 1937, the Strand Film Company, in collaboration with Imperial Airways, produced a film about the Sharjah airport entitled An Outpost. It is a short 10-minute piece, and it will set the stage in black and white for an imagination of a past Sharjah. Some of the things that I want you to kind of be clued into or pay attention to are all the different sorts of bodies that are engaged in the various sorts of tasks, from leisure to labor. It is also appropriate that this film is about an airport, because the first cinema in the UAE was the Sharjah cinema that started, in fact, at this airport, with the RAF sitting on old water tins of seats and an outdoor projector. So I'm going to show you that. Thank you. largely on a network of over 80 airports scattered through four continents. 
ground services for fueling and overhauling aircraft, for collecting and sending out weather reports by radio, for handling freight and mail, and for providing accommodation for passengers of every nationality are an essential factor of modern flight. Many of these airports have been built in the most remote parts of the world, often hundreds of miles from the nearest source of supply. Such an airport is Sharjah, on the south coast of the Persian Gulf, midway between Basra and Karachi, a section of the Indian-Australian route which crosses the marshes of the Euphrates Delta, the sun-baked deserts of Arabia, and the barren wastes of Baluchistan, 1,700 miles of desolate and almost uninhabited country over which our airliners fly as safely and regularly as we take our daily ride to the office. Georgia is a hot, desolate spot on the edge of the South Arabian desert. The airport has its own engineering shop, radio office, and meteorological station. In charge is a European station superintendent. The airport is built in the shape of a square fort as a precaution against possible but improbable raids by wandering tribes of Bedouins. Two miles distant across the glare of the desert is the Arab city, until recently a center for pirates who were active up and down the Gulf. Sharjah is still peopled by Arabs of the same Jawazmi tribes, by religion fanatical Wahhabi, but today it is ruled over by a sheikh who is friendly to the British government. To the city come camel caravans from Muscat and from distant Bulkala. They are bringing merchandise to trade in the markets or for shipment by Dao to nearby ports along the coast and across the Gulf of Persia. At the southern end of the city is the palace of the Sheikh, Sultan bin Saga, a huge medieval building with battlemented walls. Here in the gateway, a council is held each day to discuss local affairs and to settle disputes among the people. population of some 15,000 Arabs, with a sprinkling of Indian and Persian merchants. Until recently, gun running and slave dealing with Africa were a profitable business. Today, the chief labor of the people is boat building and pearl fishing. The oyster banks of the Persian Gulf begin here at Sharjah and stretch 300 miles northward along the coast to Bahrain and Kuwait. They produce the finest pearls in the world. Cows and sheep Camels and goats are traded in the markets. In the crowded and dark bazaars, lentils, coffee and rice, and dried eggs stained with cochineal are bought and sold. Today, as on every day, a merchant from the city is carrying to the airport across the burning desert such fresh food as the markets can provide. GMT, Captain Robinson in charge. With today's wind, she should be here about 5.30. If she's at all late, Mr. Smith, we'll need flares and floodlights for night landing. Will you please have them ready? Yeah, I'll see that done. And Wilcoxon, would you ask the aircraft for the names of the passengers? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to scan. Sam's coming tonight. Uh, I'll come and inspect the rooms in half an hour. Uh, Airplane coming half past five. More than chance. At once preparations begin for the arrival of the airline. She is eastbound for India and Australia, four days out from England. Provisions are brought from the storehouse to supplement. 
an envelope of supply. You need rooms and doctor in it, and beds made up, because Sharjah is a night stop. All through the hot afternoon, donkeys bring cans of water from a well in the desert to fill the tank in the courtyard of the fort. Water to provide baths for the passengers and crew. for brought parcels of pearls for shipment by air to dealers in Bombay and Calcutta. In the days before the air route, pearls were sent by sea or by long journey over land. But now the native merchants always make use of the airline to carry their wealth. From now until the airliner departs at dawn tomorrow, the station superintendent will have no time for leisure. He must inspect the bedrooms to see that everything is in order, supervise the food, and attend to a multitude of other details. Outside, on the airport itself, another part of the organization is at work. The mobile beacon is wheeled into position. The 6,000 candle power floodlight is uncovered in case the airliner should be delayed by headwind and so just fail to make Sharjah before sudden nightfall. Mobile petrol pumps are got ready, so that the refueling of the airliner's tanks can begin the moment she lands. The radio office in the fort keeps in constant touch with the airliner as she approaches down the gulf. is shown his room and handed a card giving the time of tomorrow's departure, the places at which stops will be made for meals, 
and all other details of the day's flight. While those in the fort are preparing to eat and sleep, the engineers out on the desert aerodrome are beginning to overhaul the airline. Through the gathering dusk and far into the night, the work of testing the engines and checking the controls goes on. The first stage of tomorrow's flight is a 450-mile hop across empty desert and shark-ridden sea. must be discovered. A balloon is released from the roof of the meteorological station. A small electric light is attached to the tail, and from observations of the speed of its ascent, the force and direction of the wind at different heights can be calculated. Information of the greatest importance to the pilots on tomorrow's ride. Dawn breaks over the desert. Sorry, it's YouTube. It's gonna skip. It's almost over. Okay, so um, it's such a lovely little film. Um, and the reason I wanted to watch the entire film is because it's important to get some sense of um, public culture of that time period, right? And the kinds of films that are moving around at that time period and, and, and imagining um, what kinds of information about other spaces uh, individuals who might watch this in, in the 40s might might have some image of, of here. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important to kind of keep in mind that this is kind of like early advertising for Imperial Airways. So it's, it's almost like a predecessor to the leisure hotel advertising that we might see today um, in, in this region. So if you think about uh, the audience that they had in mind when they created it, it was all about, look, we're so scientifically, technologically advanced, we're really clean, we're really on top of things, everyone is orderly, everyone listens to us. Um, and so I think all of these messages are very much a part of the rhetoric that this film was trying to establish during a time. And it has a sort of, um, it has an impact then on, on future generations, especially for um, the RAF pilots who we're going to be talking about significantly. It also, I think, beautifully illustrates, although um, it is part of a colonial archive, um, how immediately visible invisible labor is, right? The domestic labor, um, the various kinds of forms of colonized bodies that were in that space. And so even though these um, brown male bodies barely speak except to take orders and or repeat them, 
uh, they are rendered visible in film. And I think that's very important and very significant, um, especially in terms of this and the project at large. Last week, I actually went to visit Mahatma Museum. And I was struck by how both the architecture of the museum, the architecture of the rest house that now becomes a museum, and then the architecture and structures of labor are actually quite well preserved. So moving to World War II, just to kind of keep moving along. During World War II, the RAF makes, uh, made Sharjah into a base, and they continued to use it until the 1970s. Um, as I mentioned in relationship uh, to Lawrence Gary's discovery of Flight Watkinson's uh, burial ground, etc., this airport was a major station in the Jebel Akbar War of the 1950s. A new control tower was built next to the fort, and a new terminal followed in 1968. But the rapidly growing town, uh, so rapidly growing from a town into a city of Sharjah, was now too close, and the new airport opened in the desert just south of the city uh, in su southern parts of Sharjah in 1977. The runway at RAF Sharjah became King Abdul Aziz Street. This street has been cited in the online community of pilots, the ones that I refer to, as being right in the center of the city, being referred to as being in the heart of Sharjah. As we previously hesitated between air and land, I now want to linger for a moment in the harshness of a landing, the concreteness, the immediacy of a landing on what used to be tarmac, an airport which now might be a parking lot. And I would now like to introduce you to one other member of this archived community of pilots from the Professional Pilots Rumor Network, Captain Salman. Captain Salman first posted on the 29th of October, 2011. At the time, he was 27 years old. He, in total, posted 47 times. I'm going to read his first post to you. Um, and again, this is part of an ethnographic. This is kind of what we do as anthropologists. We give a lot of ethnographic detail so you get a full sense of this. So one of the ethnographic pieces was the film. Another one is going to be this letter, which is why and I think it's pretty significant. So again, 27-year-old Captain Salman. Hello and good day to all, dear sirs. I'm an aviation enthusiast, a virtual pilot with 2,000-plus uh, IFR hours at virtual PIA, and an Anglophile. This word explains the reason I'm here at RAF Related Thread. I joined just recently after a search on the internet about old RAF Sharjah station, but unfortunately there is very limited information and photographs available. I'm stunned and at the same time delighted to know that there are actual ex-RAF pilots here who served Sharjah. You will all be happy to know that I live in a building which is just situated in front of the old hangar. I've been living in this area called Al Mahatta, meaning a station in Arabic, for five years now. I've grown up in Sharjah, and now I'm 27 years old. I'm fascinated by the historical significance of this area, and I have done a detailed survey of the entire RAF vicinity. I have been searching for clues and remains of old RAF buildings and quarters in this area. My intention is to compare the now and then images, and oh, if I could go back and smell the time, the time when Sharjah ruled the skies of the Gulf. I will be posting some pictures after this post of this area now. My recent attempt was to visit the place just behind the old hangar. I could see the remains of a room with the pin board still on the wall. And I could see the pinhole in it, indicating that at one point in time, this used to be a map on the board with clipboards and marks with an aerial view of Sharjah. I could literally imagine that as a quick flashback. Another was a very old WC just beside it, some demolished walls, and the wooden roof still remains, and one of the rooms had burned down severely. I could say this because of the burned wooden roof frames. I will post detailed pictures of the ruined quarters of RAF and the current condition of the old hangar, which is situated outside the museum premises, where one of you might have even stayed. You never know. What's more interesting is that I have tried to dig a few inches just beside the old hangar's gate, the same hangar where the squadron group picture is taken with two helicopters on each side earlier in this thread. So he's referring now to something that has been shown pri prior to this time. And after digging, I have found traces of engine oil in the sand, a couple of very old bo bolts, and interestingly, a British petroleum labeled tap made of black plastic, probably from some old can which contained planes engine oil. Noticing the design of BP on it, I found that it was very old, round about from the 1950s or 60s perhaps. The area is surrounded by residential buildings and many plots are empty and still one could see the old tarmac taxiways and aircraft parking spots all over Al Mahatta area. And I will post pictures of these tarmac remains soon. With the general and also the General Electric GE light pole remains on the ground with the label Made in England, two exclamation points. I salute to all ex-RAF officers and pilot and as a token of appreciation to your services to the British Empire, 
I would love to accompany you with a detailed guided tour of my area today, refreshing all your past memories as I am fully aware of Al Mahatta area as of 2011. That is whenever any one of your respected personalities visit Sharjah, please contact me. By this even, I will gain knowledge about the geographical changes from the mid-19th century to present, and I will love to hear your RAF Sharjah stories. Here is my email. May I profoundly request to your good selves that if you have any other RAF Sharjah airport pictures from the time, please post, as I am very desperate to see how this area looked during its heyday. The main aircraft parking area is now converted to a small park called Mahatta Park, just beside the RAF fort where my building is located. I will update all of you with the pictures. Please share your RAF Sharjah stories with me. With best regards, Salman from Sharjah, UAE. A vast majority of the individuals who report their age on this chat site are in the range of 73 to 79 years of age. They are individuals tel telling stories and histories of their time with RAF. They are swapping old photographs, asking each other to remember the name of the third person from the left. They argue over maps and Landsat images. They also occasionally, like Lawrence Gary, do soft excavation to look for specific crashes. And even though Professor Gary was teaching anatomy, he had served in RAF reserve and based on his comments flown many planes. And so these older gentlemen were all intimately knowledgeable about wingspans, engines, hangars, certain kinds of jet fuel, and imagery of a land from the sky. Being RAF, they all belonged to a community and, and even a family of sorts. Captain Salman, this is his no name, right? On chat sites, you always have a sort of name that you put in. Captain Salman is 27. He has lived most of his life in Sharjah. He has never flown a plane, but enthusiastically reports his many virtual hours of flying. And he proudly proclaims his Anglophilic orientation and desire to have been part of a tradition that links to a British colonial past on this land. His affective desire to smell the time is quite poignant. No one responds to him until Professor Gary says something. Gary welcomes him to the site, saying in the course of his post, in quotes, I find your description of remnants still at Al-Mahatta very interesting and would like to keep in contact with you about your finds, end quote. And so Captain Salman shares his finds, annotating each photograph with a commentary. In order to get a sense of his work, I have selected a few of his images and associated captions, and I'm going to present them in chronological order that is in the order that he presented it to the group. And this is very important because the image and text together are very significant. So let's begin with his data set. This is where the mighty hawkers used to be parked once now turned into a car park. View facing west, same car park. Very ironic, while I was standing on this old field, I wondered how many loyal RAF officers would have proudly walked in the same area I am standing upon. This is what I found after digging many inches. It's actually probably centimeters, but that's okay. Many inches, traces of aircraft engine oil, most likely from RAF era, and an old BP cap and an old piece of clothing used for cleaning. West corner of the hangar adjacent to the mosque. Does anyone remember these blue iron rods seen in the 60s? More towards the left is this old door now sealed from inside, the broken room walls also visible. This is ghostly, really. It's like diving down the wreck of the RMS Titanic and looking at the remains of the dining salon entrance and comparing how it was in 1912. I'm sure many of you would have gone down the memory lane right this very moment. This old remains of the office quarters, are these the old remains of office quarters or offices? Behind the hangar is what I was talking about, room with the pin board still on the wall and a lavatory remains on the right side, broken walls on the side, the roof markings on the wall remind me of the different phases during different times. There is a picture below of a ground metal frame of sorts. I'm not aware of it. It says General Electric, made in England. A light pole, perhaps? These metal frames are multiple in numbers and are, and are over most of the remaining airfield. Could anyone enlighten me on what this frame actually was? Captain Salman's ability to engage with the memories of a past time through the tangible remains on the ground established him within the disparate community of RAF pilots. As each post and picture proceeded, his tone became more familiar, and his manner of questioning shifted in a way that placed himself into a location of memories, thus asserting a belonging to a time that established belonging for an expatriate community. 
With each piece that he uncovered, displayed, asked for information about, he disclosed his intimacy with the place, his ability to touch, to move the dirt, the land, the same one upon which RAF landed. As this progressed, the RAF pilots began to share with him and give him kudos, but only after Lawrence Gary posts the following. Great pictures, Salman, and a great piece of aviation archaeology, Lawrence. With that, Captain Salman, the young virtual pilot, was brought into a community in which folks now, like 77-year-old Breitwell, posted more intimate memories of the RAF from the 1960s. For example, this one, with a caption that read, Drinks at the Fort, Christmas 1960. Captain Salman responded appropriately by posting to all of the elders in the community. He actually had a very long post, but I'm just going to read you the bottom end of it. It's an honor for me, really. Please pardon my restlessness. I know I'm a bit hyper about this topic. But I am, after all, like your grandson. And at this age, everyone is hyperactive, more or less. And through that articulation, solidified his position into a family, into a heritage, and into the heart of the city. In a very real way, Captain Salman is engaging with his own location. His apartment building overlooks the old RAF base. What was theirs is, in fact, his neighborhood. His imagination of a sepia-toned time was a part of his everyday life in Mahatta. Given that he lives in an apartment building overlooking this area, we might even consider how this vantage point and sight lines of the landscape are similar to one's landing into the old airport, even if it has changed. And he speaks of that in his post. What, what must this place have looked like when the RAF were stationed there? That's one of his questions. One can only, almost imagine a young South Asian male looking out of the window of the apartment building trying to gain some sense of history. He recreates a sense of memory utilizing mnemonic devices that are part of the tangible and intangible experiences of another generation of men. But what allows that intersection with memory to even happen, and for the claim of a shared heritage to even emerge, is that he physically occupies a space within which these memories are embedded, and he excavates them, literally. If we might consider heritage a constructed value through memory, articulating belonging, then an intimate heritage acknowledges the affective relationship between the tangible or intangible heritage and that particular memory. That affect allows for discerning of how <coughs> one belongs. Within the discourse of heritage practice, when talking about how most people engage with their heritage, they speak of local geography, the locale of where you are, the space that you occupy with other cultural objects, or as we said earlier in the paper, emirathana, Right? That is the tangible and intangible cultural heritage of the Emirates. So in some way, perhaps, it is possible, although it might make me uncomfortable, it is possible that Captain Salman has this image of people enjoying a Christmas drink in the fort in 1960 and might be able to answer my question with why these people are part of his album and what relation he might have to them with an... Oh, no, that's just Emirathana. We're not really related to them. But aren't these images just beautiful and make you feel a sense of our history? And although not pictured, maybe, just maybe, Captain Salman's fictional relatives, if part of that rumored narrative, were the invisible members not developed in any of the squadron pictures. But they might have been holding up the lights for the camera, or bringing in the tea, or in fact serving the drinks at the Christmas party at the fort in 1960. In some measure, this image is, as an archive can only exist because of their labor. Perhaps it is their intimacy with the production of the archival narrative that allows for some claim to a history within the production of a nation. But as I mentioned, this is still a work in progress. And not just my project, the city is still working on its own ideas of heritage and constructing, engineering, and realizing how it wants to proceed with the messiness and necessary complication of belonging. And as of we've seen here today, heritage is a necessarily complicated business. Thank you.